So good morning, everybody. I, I think I didn't shake everybody's hands, but uh, I'm really glad to be here. And um, uh, it was a, a long trip as, after coming from an interval meeting, me and Brian uh, in Germany last week. Uh, but uh, really, it's, it's a good opportunity for us to share some of our views and uh, also get uh, feedback from you. So uh, I thought it was still time to introduce myself because I've been here for five months. Uh, like I said, I'm, uh, I'm Brazilian. I inherited my German citizenship that facilitated a little bit my life in Europe. Uh, I got a degree, what we call in Brazil agronomy. Here, apparently, agronomy is only plant science, but in Brazil, it's plant and animal science. And, uh, and then I went to Montreal. So I spent five years, wonderful years in Montreal in my master's and uh, PhD program. Uh, working with uh, uh, what to me was a completely new world of animal breeding and genetics of dairy cattle. And uh, after that I went back to Brazil. For 11 years I was teaching at university and I also was involved in milk recording, uh, milk quality. I was in charge of a lab, milk, uh, milk analysis lab. And also was uh, quite uh, involved in the administration of the university per se. So that involvement in administration qualified me to apply for this job in Uppsala, uh, Sweden, as Interval Center Director. So one of the uh, people that was one of the persons that were sitting in the uh, Selection committee is in front of me now and is going to speak after me. And uh, I knew Brian from, from Canada already. And it were six years in Sweden that were very interesting. I, my job interview was actually here in the U.S. when the ICAR and Interbull uh, had their meeting, annual meeting in Niagara Falls, 2008. And I walk into that room thinking about, well, I have to look good because, you know, I'm, I'm applying for a job and all that. And then I start to hear the presentations there talk about this new beast that I never really had much, uh, uh, or much to say because genomics was something that we would read on paper here and there, but was not really something that uh, I would consider to be already being applied. And I finally got the job, and then the first uh, two uh, tasks was to lead a task force in genomics that uh, counted with probably some of the most uh, preeminent scientists in the field at that time. We had to set the pace of what uh, really we were going to do at the international level with uh, genomic methodologies and all that. And the second one was to respond to the question, is, still, is interval still relevant? <laughs> we had a... We had a meeting, and it was quite a challenging time, and I, I learned really a lot to be in the middle of this revolution. Uh, and I could see all the time uh, uh, the importance of uh, North America, of U.S., uh, and uh, how fundamental it is for the whole uh, international uh, dairy industry to count on uh, U.S. Uh, genetics. So I was really glad when I got the invitation to apply and, and finally I was selected to become the CEO of CDCB. And I hope to tell you a little bit uh, why I'm excited today. Um, I'm not going to bring you too many technical details because George is here. And uh, if you have any difficult questions, I will say, well, George can respond to that because <laughs> he uh, knows better. But no, because we're both speaking here, we decided that he would be addressing more technical issues and I will be talking more about uh, institutional uh, matters. So, and, uh, and I'm trying to see if I go fast, I can sell part of my time to Brian because he thinks that one hour is too little for him. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we are living as they both said, uh, the genomics era. Uh, so 
In the genomics era, the dairy industry is beca has become all about data control. Um, the first thing that we realized sooner rather than later was that phenotypes are much more important than genotypes. We were all excited about genotypes. Oh, we, we, now we can uh, uh, see the SNPs and we can tell this and we can tell that, but then we realized, well, the SNPs are useless if we don't have the phenotypes. So this is really the era of the phenotypes because if we don't have that is th those observations on uh, performance, on uh, type, on uh, physiological uh, uh, characteristics, on whatever you can measure, then genomics is really not so powerful because you cannot make sense of this information. So phenotypes are really uh, what drives the industry and this is what we have to uh, focus when we establish a long-term uh, strategic plan for the dairy industry. We have to collect data, more and better data. But, so having said that, the, the initial cost of the genotypes that were, well, were cheaper than ever anyone would imagine 10 years ago, but it was still a bit expensive. They made a, uh, an interesting turn because countries that were normally considering themselves as competitors and not sharing anything, they soon realized that they needed to be together in order to grow. The best example and the first example was set by Canada and US with the CDDR uh, common uh, repository of genotypes and uh, was followed by other uh, groups of uh, clusters of countries. So we ended up with two major uh, blocks. One is uh, the North American uh, consortium with uh, also the addition of Italy and UK. And the other one is what's known as Eurogenomics that is basically uh, Germany, France, uh, Nordic countries, Netherlands, Poland, and Spain. Um, and this has shaped a little bit the uh, discussions at the international level and uh, certainly are uh, shaping the, potentially shaping the future of the industry. But many people see in this uh, the competition oh, now we are really one against the other. What I see is really the cooperation because within the groups, they have put aside a lot of differences, a lot of uh, problems that uh, they would see in, in, in having something in common. And they are, or we are, uh, cooperating very actively uh, with our partners. So it actually, you can see that as a really opportunity to uh, grow together. Another consequence of the genomics was the technological gap. We always had a technological gap between uh, some breeds, major breeds, minor breeds, uh, leading countries, uh, countries that were importing mainly and all that. But genomics basically made it more evident because if you don't have uh, uh, reference population that will back you up to have a genomic evaluation, then you really are back in line and you have to uh, uh, fall behind. We have to buy genomics or genetics from somebody else. So this is something that is more evident than ever that you have uh, uh, breeds that are leading and you have also uh, countries that are leading. And uh, the other ones will take a while to catch up. The other thing, well, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching uh, to the choir here, is the young bull's rule. So this was something that we couldn't imagine some years ago. Unfortunately, we are, we are seeing this uh, adopted in uh, most countries that uh, have genomics. Some countries that do not have genomics are still slow to adopt uh, completely the, the, the genomic bulls, but it's a matter of time. Traditional business models are challenged. 
I mean, we cannot make a mistake that think that we can keep doing our business the same way we did before because it's not uh, the same uh, landscape anymore. So uh, all the institutions and organizations are uh, called to question themselves or on how their business uh, model fits to the new uh, situation. And of course, we have uh, innovative new partners, that uh, new players that were not uh, really so close to uh, the dairy business or the dairy genetics before, and now they are playing a very important role. So this is also something that uh, adds, to, uh, adds to the equation. But genetic improvement is still the same. You set your breeding goals, uh, you create an information database to be able to address uh, the question of uh, selecting animals. Uh, you run genetic evaluations and you select the breeding animals that you're going to use as parents of the next generation. So this didn't change, genomics didn't change yet. It just put some more uh, spice on it, for example. We're still asking ourselves which kind of cow do farmers need. It's still the same kind of cow. We still have the same goals as before. We have new opportunities with uh, these new tools that we have in hands. Who gets to choose which are the goals? I mean, it's still how long is the dairyman that is still going to say, okay, this is the kind of cow that I want to breed, this is the kind of bull that I'm going to use to breed my cows? Or are we going more towards a situation like pig industry and poultry industry? This is something that uh, I don't have the answer, but we better have the question because we need to watch what, uh, in which direction our industry is going. In terms of information database, we are used to have the management uh, data and type data and all this uh, data that is collected by DHI and breed associations coming into the database. And then we started to get the genomic data. And this genomic data is not only from our own farms, but also we get from international uh, partners, pedigrees, of course. But uh, we also are looking, well, we need new traits. We have a very exciting new tool, very powerful new tool in hands, and uh, we can and we must enhance the portfolio of traits that we offer to our producers to choose from. Uh, so fitness data, automated data, more and more in the US we have these herds that are uh, not collecting data in the uh, traditional sense, and we need to get this data into flowing into the system. Uh, contracted data, so this is a trend uh, worldwide that uh, uh, entire herds are contracted to supply data to, uh, for some sort of trades. And uh, we have the sequencing data also coming um, that we uh, certainly need to uh, consider. In terms of genetic evaluation, we have now still conventional evaluations, genomic evaluations, and uh, we are looking for novel methods. So I don't know which is the surprise or what, what are we going to be doing in five years, but I'm, I'm almost certain that we're not going to be doing exactly what we're doing now. New methodologies are coming and uh, new ways of doing our job will come soon uh, and we will have to adapt. So as you see, the picture is not so clean as it was before. But uh, these are challenges that we have to face. So the CDCB opportunity, uh, I was really, I have been uh, following the US industry for a long time, not only from the research perspective. I mean, uh, George, Paul, uh, Rex, and, and Dwayne were, when I was a PhD student, the, he, I was really looking forward into, into what they were doing all the time, but also as an industry. I was uh, following, especially in the last six years where I was in Interpol, and uh, I had a very glad, uh, I felt very, uh, very gladly that the U.S. Uh, industry was able to uh, put together the proposal of uh, organization that we have now for the CDCB. So the industry statement, this is in our web page, I just want to 
uh, highlight some of the terms here. So uh, integrity of data, this is fundamental. And this is what makes the difference when you have a national database with data that have been checked and uh, corrected and uh, it establishes really a standard for, as a reference for the <coughs> genetic evaluation of the country. Uh, we have to maintain a strong body of research and development and also education because otherwise you cannot make the industry follow the developments. Um, information is something that has to be readily available for the industry. Everybody has to have access to good information in order to make uh, good decisions. Uh, the focus is really to improve U.S. dairy cattle. I mean, we are the leading industry uh, in the world, but only because we are focused on our own uh, improvement uh, in-house. And this has to be the priority. So all the actions should be targeting improvement of uh, U.S. dairy farms, U.S. dairy breeds, U.S. dairy cattle. And finally, of course, keep up uh, the uh, tools available that uh, will in, uh, make it possible to be, as, uh, the industry to be as competitive as possible. So these are the, uh, this is the mission statement. When you look at the objectives, the cooperative database is the center. So this is really the focus, because without this cooperative database, uh, nothing that we do is really possible. And the industry depends on this, on having this combined database as a reference. Uh, so uh, the CDCB is the forum, so that uh, we have all the sectors in the industry sitting together and uh, addressing the main or the most uh, important questions together there. Uh, setting standards for data quality, as I said before. Uh, also providing data certification, and of course, running the genetic evaluations. So the cooperation of CDCB includes the National Association of Animal Breeders. I'm not going to go into each of the players, but just to give an idea of the complexity of this industry. We also have the National Dairy Herd Information Association, Purebred uh, uh, Dairy Cattle Association, Dairy Records Processing Centers. So this is a very complex industry. I don't know if any other industry in the world is as complex as the US, both because of the size, but also because of the number of players and uh, because of the different uh, uh, or the heterogeneity of the developments that occur in different regions and different states. But the good thing is that after this uh, exercise, political exercise, the CDCB was able to put together a very interesting uh, setting for the governance in which one of, each one of these sectors has three representatives in the board. And uh, uh, this creates an equilibrium for the discussions. We also have allied industries, non-voting members. One of them, Doug, is, is sitting here. Where is Doug? <laughs> there. So we can count on, on uh, their uh, wisdom as well. So it has been a successful uh, cooperation. And many things that people thought that uh, would never come together uh, are coming together now. Regarding our genetic evaluation process, this is what we are building. Uh, but basically what we can say, the demands come through these partners. So uh, the CDCB uh, respects the individual, uh, uh, individual uh, organizations that are part of, so we're not going to do their jobs so they are still in charge of their own umbrellas, and they will bring us the demands after discussing within each one of their uh, sectors. Uh, and then uh, research and development will still be done by Agile USDA. And this is one thing, maybe not in the US anymore, but outside we still think people say, well, CDCB is replacing USDA Agile, which is far from true. 
we are adding to it. Uh, Agile and, and USDA will still be in the heart of the development. Uh, we're just putting more people to work for the good of this uh, evaluation system. So um, I, I don't think I would be very comfortable with my job if I would say, uh, well, I'm taking over from USDA. That would be really, really a uh, hundred times harder job than counting on them still, uh, but focus on the uh, research and development part, which is what they do better than anyone. Then there's the implementation, which is uh, a combination between the developers, uh, or the ones that are proposing the changes, and, and CDCB staff to, to make it uh, work into services. So basically, this is the vision of the integration to have the US genetic valuations from now on. Funding, this I, I stole from, uh, from George, maybe he will present this tomorrow again. But basically our funding is based on uh, uh, fee system, so an animal's genotype. Uh, this figure we were, I don't know, from the proposal of budget that we had this year, we imagine about 80% coming from bulls. It could be more, it has been almost 90, but uh, um, the principle is that those that contribute to the system with data, they will have less fees or no fees in our services. Uh, and this is a recognition that the system depend on these herds that are contributing data for years and uh, that this is uh, uh, fundamental to have a genetic and genomic evaluation in the first place. USDA research and evaluation uh, is, is funded by US government. So yesterday we had the new fee schedule be, uh, uh, being implemented. So basically, we have a reduction in the fees uh, in all uh, levels. And uh, basically, the, the proportion of the reduction was, was about the same. So we still have the same policy, just uh, smaller values. And the main reason for that is that we have accumulated uh, resources that uh, uh, we consider to be uh, sufficient for the activities that we have, and, the, and then, and therefore, we 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 are very glad that we got these uh, contributions and that we went into genotyping much better than we expected in the beginning. So uh, you can find that in our website. It's very good, good deal now. <laughs> so this is to give you an idea. In 2004, the number of animals nominated by, for each uh, of these uh, fee codes. Um, so if, uh, when I go back, uh, if, you, if you see the, the code, uh, the rate code one is those, uh, are those that uh, are supplying data to the system. So they will, for, for females, they will not pay anything. and. Uh, uh, for males, they will pay the minimum uh, initial fee. And uh, two, then, is, is the ones that are supplying data for less time or in a, to a less extent. And then three are the ones that are not supplying data. But uh, you can see, basically, if you consider that uh, uh, fee codes rate six and five are the ones that really uh, generate more no, actually, no, the males are the ones that generate more because here is not included the AI fee, which is a separate fee than uh, the initial fee. But you can see that uh, although we have much more females being genotypes, most of the uh, revenues are coming from the male as intended. That was the idea from the beginning. So the, the, I'm not going to bug you with this uh, genomic nomination process. Uh, we probably are familiar that we need, we have a few nominators that have been, uh, uh, cre not credited, but they are uh, uh, approved by CDCB and they're able to nominate uh, animals to be uh, participate in the genomic evaluation. So they send the genotypes to us. So here's just a description of uh, uh, the steps. 
But George also has made a very nice uh, flow that explains that. So basically we have this flow between uh, of, of samples and then the re return uh, of genomic evaluations uh, and also we check the, the data integrity in the process. So we have here the participation of the farmer, the nominators, the DNA laboratories, and also the uh, breed, breed associations and also uh, the DRPCs. So it's working uh, quite well, and uh, we are happy with these new partners that uh, are providing data to, to the system. To have, uh, just to get, get a new, uh, another look at these uh, numbers from uh, 2014, these are the number of animals that have been nominated uh, by sex in uh, the Ayrshire breed. Uh, so the same figures for the brown Swiss. The, the explanation for this peak is because of this international consortium called Intergenomics. Uh, through Interbull, uh, the brown Swiss uh, countries decided to share all the uh, reference animals and also the young animals. So we have the genotypes from most of the uh, brown Swiss uh, countries in the world in our database. Um, then if we look at Holstein, we can see some peaks there before the uh, evaluations, the <coughs> official evaluations. And uh, November was really a record for 2014. Uh, and I know that with the new prices, now we will beat all these records. <laughs> And this is for Jersey, which is doing very well as well, not only Holstein, but Jersey is amazing, the, the number of uh, uh, genotypes that we are uh, processing for the Jersey breed, uh, which reflects the growth of the breed as a whole. So in terms of services, uh, like I said, one of the main services that uh, we have, that uh, it's a quiet service, George is very much uh, committed to that is data quality verification, but this is starts already in the DHI level when we have uh, the verification of the quality of the data that comes from the field. <clears throat> then the maintenance of the national database, it's uh, probably the most complex operation. Well, with genetic evaluations, I don't know, uh, maybe genetic and genomic evaluations will be more, uh, as complex as it, it is, and then uh, uh, benchmarking information uh, provided to the farmers as well. So uh, I just got a, our speaker this afternoon was uh, talking that he really appreciates our queries, so I hope uh, everybody's using the queries uh, as actively. In terms of evaluation calendar, I think most of you are familiar, but, it's, but just to give you an idea of the intensity of the operations, we have this in blue, these three official evaluations in April, August, and December, and then monthly genomic evaluations, weekly predictions, for genomic prediction, also interim summaries, and we still building a team. So it has been quite intense uh, to, to keep up with this, this calendar. Uh, difference between the, the CDCB monthly genomic evaluations and weekly preliminary uh, genomic predictions, uh, I felt that this was important to put here because uh, we, saw, we see some uh, confusion sometimes. So the monthly uh, evaluations, they include all the genotypes, imp imputation is performed, genomic reliabilities are calculated, uh, pedigree up are updated. Uh, the SNP effects are re-estimated, the combination of DGV and, and parent averages are made in the, in the regular methodology, and they're official. While the weekly preliminary predictions, they only include those animals that were received since the last weekly release. So it's a one-week batch of animals that is uh, included. It doesn't go through imputation, uh, doesn't have rel genomic reliabilities, uh, and uh, no pedigrees information. It's a, not the application, basically the application of the uh, prediction formula. So I'm not saying they're bad, but they're different. 
They're different products and they, they serve different purposes. Okay? So, uh, one of the things that uh, we see some confusion is that they are not supposed to be for publication because they don't even have a reliability associated with them, uh, the, the weekly preliminary predictions. Uh, but having said that, I mean, they're a very good uh, tool for the farmers and for the nominators and for whoever is handling uh, uh, or nominating gen uh, uh, genotypes to the CDCB. Okay, well, this is just a detail, but uh, no, I put it. But uh, I mean, although we can see differences between the results, a slight difference, but the correlations are extremely high. They really are very close to the actual value. Um, and otherwise, we wouldn't release them. And uh, it incentives uh, a smooth uh, uh, workload. For, because before the, the weekly evaluation, we had the labs overwhelmed with a high number of uh, samples coming uh, towards the time that uh, uh, we would have the, the, the monthly genomic evaluation. So it was not a very good flow for the uh, DNA labs. With this, uh, we can have a more uh, sustainable uh, workload for these uh, labs. And also, it allows for early culling of animals uh, in, in the farm level. And this is probably the main tool and the main reason that we have uh, seen farmers uh, to appreciate the weekly evaluations. Not only for the, the, P, the genomic PTA, but also you can see <coughs> the gene tests, and sometimes you can uh, avoid uh, having in your farm uh, undesirable animals. Uh, so they're not for publication, but they are very useful for management purposes. There might be changes in the weekly evaluations in the future, but now this is the status of this situation. So just to have a look in the, uh, the genomic database that we have, I, I, I lost track of the time. How, how am I doing? Okay. 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 Um, so this is the uh, separated by a continent. Uh, the number of uh, female and male uh, genotypes that uh, are in the uh, database. This is in December. Uh, so you can see, of course, uh, uh, most uh, of the animals are young, are from North America, of course. Most of the animals are female, but we have a very, very big number of uh, males also in the database. Um, so to a total of uh, 776,000, but we are uh, already uh, approaching 900,000. And soon this year we will uh, reach 1 million uh, genotypes in the database. So it's really a very powerful uh, database. It's the largest in the world. I also put here, I thought it would be interesting to see uh, the country of registration, of course, if you have a Canadian bull that is owned by a, a U.S. company, you could say, well, this is U.S. bull, actually, but we, for statistics, it's hard to, to have that, but, but using just the uh, country of registration, we can see Canada by far, especially because of our uh, policy uh, of sharing all the genotypes with each other. So we have 90,000 uh, genotypes from Canada. But then you can see, followed by Italy, which is also our partner, uh, Germany, France, Netherlands, and so on and so forth. So at the bottom, you can see there uh, USA uh, registration, the country of registration at 76% of the all genotypes and uh, coming to about uh, 584,000 uh, in total. Another interesting uh, statistic that was made by uh, Mel Tucker and, and, and Paul Van Reynen is look at the country of sire. It's not sire of sires. It can be sire of sire or sire of, of, uh, of cow. All animals 
if you look at the country of Sire, and then you can see the superiority. You can say, well, this is just the US database, but I can tell you that if there is a, a database that is representative of the world genetics, is ours. So you can see by continent who supplies the sires um, in all this uh, different uh, environment, and US by far the leader, and Canada the second. This is the rule, I mean, I'm not surprised for anyone, I, but here we can see numbers, how significant that is. I mean, of course, Africa and Asia here are represented by small numbers, uh, but if you look at uh, Latin America and Eastern Europe, it's already uh, uh, a larger number of animals that have been added to our uh, uh, database, and you see USA of uh, around 60% in both continents, and uh, here includes Mexico in, in this Latin America. Mexico is not in North America. Uh, and uh, Canada comes with uh, between 8 and 13. And then if we go to the continents that, where we have the uh, most developed uh, uh, dairy uh, farming, then we also have, of course, North America. We make up to 95% uh, between the US and Canada. But uh, even in Europe, 50% of the animals are sired by uh, US bulls. And uh, Oceania, which they have a completely different production system, uh, and they use a lot of crossbreeding, and uh, animals are under pasture, especially in New Zealand, who still are the leaders in terms of uh, number of uh, uh, Cow, uh, cows and bulls that are sired by U.S. animals. So this shows not only that we're doing well in terms of sales, that we are uh, recognized by what we're doing here in U.S., but also shows the responsibility that we have. If we do something wrong here, we're going to affect a lot of people. I mean, the whole, the entire business will be uh, affected. And uh, we have to think really... Uh, uh, a lot on our role in this uh, scenario. What kind of leadership are we going to be uh, uh, taking in this uh, world their genetics? How are we going to use this leverage that we have? And uh, it's, I think uh, it's a good position to start with, but it's still we have the responsibility to uh, define that in a very good way. So that's the title they gave me. And I could stop here and say, well, uh, be sure you are here when George comes tomorrow because he will tell you. <laughs> but uh, I'll read some, some things uh, that I learned in these five months. Uh, so the latest implementations that you are, I have already talked about the weekly preliminary genomic predictions that were, I think, a significant change. But also December run was, uh, I was told, I wasn't here before, but I was told that from Agile uh, group, from Dwayne and Lee that worked with me, that was probably the, 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 the run with the most significant number of changes ever. So it was really, really crazy, but we glad, we're glad we, we, we did it, because there were significant and important changes to cover, like uh, the genetic base, uh, the updates in the net merit and other uh, indices that uh, we publish, creation of the proposal of a new index, the grazing merit that we hope uh, will be uh, appreciated by a niche uh, market in U.S. and some other markets uh, outside U.S. Uh, and a very important thing that most people don't see, it has been a major update in the evaluation software, which is our everyday. And it's something that you don't like to do because it screws things up and you have to test everything. And uh, the Agile group has done a very good job. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, we had a lot of uh, moments that we didn't know exactly how we were going. We had a few glitches in the results. But compared to what has been changed and what has been improved, it was really under control. And uh, it was a successful run. Uh, so I've been talking to my colleagues at Agile, well, what kind of, what can I tell these guys there? What is coming? 
That's what they ask me. And uh, well, this is not secret. It's no secret. They, these projects have been reported in previous uh, events already, and probably George will give you a better picture. But uh, one of the ideas is that we should add new trades to the portfolio. Or the probably most uh, expected ones are, are the health trades. We have uh, made good progress in research in that uh, field. Now we are uh, uh, committed to uh, cut a deal with the data suppliers so that we can have this data for research and in, in the future to have that also for routine evaluation. So my, I, I come in uh, for the deal and they do the research. Um, and then we have other, other projects also where that have been uh, uh, investigate age of first calving, lactation persistency, days of the first insemination. Uh, and of course, a permanent uh, matter for uh, research is always improving the accuracy of evaluations, and that might be uh, in so many different ways, but this is something that is always in the, uh, uh, in the agenda for the group, and uh, George, Paul, John have been doing that uh, uh, all the time. Gene tests as they come, new uh, 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 haplotypes are described very often and they have been incorporated to the uh, reports. And this is one of the uh, good things that uh, also in the weekly evaluations we are able to supply uh, to the herds. Uh, of course, uh, Agile also is in, uh, uh, as probably George is going to say, working on causative genetic variants as well. So the sequencing uh, data is going to bring us a lot of new knowledge that uh, not only will improve what we already do, but will show us new ways, sorry, new ways to, uh, to better understand the biology of this trace that we are all working with. <coughs> what what are my priorities? I, I could have only the first sentence and that would be probably the, uh, the truth. So we have a, a, a legal <laughs> obligation to complete the transition of services from Agile uh, before the end of 2015. Again, it's not saying we are going to separate or go in different ways, it's just a matter of having all the uh, programs running in our servers and the database sitting also in a CDCB infrastructure and releasing, let's say, uh, the Agile team from the regular routine operations because they can provide a much better uh, uh, use of their time if they're fully concentrated on research and development. So I'm struggling or I'm putting a lot of effort to form a, an, a winning team. If any one of you want to work for a CDCB, please come to see me. Um, or if you knew peop know people that uh, are the type of uh, people that we need. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding, but uh, it's, it's true. We, we are, we're putting together a team, establishing an infrastructure, and this is many ramifications, uh, and then taking control of the operations. Basically, it's training people and making people aware of how the operations go and, uh, and being able to, uh, to take uh, uh, care of that. Then establish efficient process between R&D and services. We still have to learn how we're going to make it optimal for Agile to, to get access, uh, permanent access to the data and make uh, the best of it. And also we can, if we can supply uh, things that facilitate their work. Uh, so this is something that we, uh, have to discuss as well, and one of my uh, biggest priority. Uh, improve strategic references. So CDCB has been around since 86, 88, 86, I think. But in this new format, uh, it's a startup. So we still have some strategic references that we need to, uh, to establish and or improve. And our uh, intention is to have a, a full uh, strategic planning process uh, started sometimes this year. And uh, 
develop comprehensive communication. Uh, we need to develop and uh, establish, I don't have a logo, you can see my slides without a logo. They are white and, and this is uh, on purpose. Uh, so corporate identity, we have already uh, started working on that. Improving web services, uh, I don't know, uh, um, uh, we, we need to have more time for that, but certainly our website that is based on the Agile website is one of the heaviest uh, in terms of the amount of information that it offers. So uh, we're not trying to screw anything up. Don't worry that I'm not going to change things just to to change, but to improve and, and uh, maybe have uh, uh, different sorts of communication tools there. there. And of course, consolidate the quality certification program. This has to uh, permanent, uh, be a permanent uh, goal. So take home message. Is it too early? I can, okay. So we have world-class services that offer to the U.S. industry, and we are the uh, world leading player. So I, I, I very fortunate to get here and get, have this uh, uh, job of continue doing something that is working very well. It would be much worse and if things were falling apart and nothing was in place. No, we have a system in place. We are a leading uh, organization already because we inherited something that was extremely uh, well done from uh, USDA. And uh, this is a responsibility, uh, but puts us in a very comfortable position in terms of uh, proposing uh, new things. The one, the one uh, idea that I have that is uh, very uh, powerful from that uh, organization that I showed you in, in the uh, CDCB is that we have an opportunity to coordinate actions for the entire uh, U.S. dairy industry. That doesn't mean that CDCB will tell you what you have to do in your farm or in your organizations, but it is a very powerful forum to get together and have all the players in the same table and uh, making something for the good of the industry. Uh, and this coordination is certainly of a great value, and I'll be put myself, putting myself uh, to work for that uh, very hard. Um, the largest and most diversified pool of herds to select from. So no wonder everybody's coming here to harvest embryos and to get uh, not only males but also females to uh, use in their own uh, uh, population. So this is a very valuable asset and we have to take good care of that. First priority, so is the transition now, but in the future probably will bring novel traits or new traits and genomic developments that I don't even know uh, what will be. Um, having said that, I said, I, I would like to, to finish saying that this is really uh, a time of a lot of ifs and a, lo a lot of whys for myself because in five months I learned a little bit but I still have a lot to discover. But at the same time uh, I see that we have a committed uh, a group of people that are trying to make uh, the best industry even better uh, for the future. I would like to acknowledge, oh, oh and the most important, we have to constantly improve the services to keep you guys happy, otherwise the data will not flow. And this is our main uh, commitment. So I would like to acknowledge my two pals at CDCB, Dwayne Norman and Lee Walton, that they have been uh, back from retirement since uh, almost two years now, and uh, doing the job that I was supposed to do, but I wasn't here before. And Lee is, uh, I don't know, uh, working 24-7, 365 days a year. I don't know how this guy keeps up with everything. And I also would like to, to greatly uh, acknowledge uh, uh, George, Paul, John. They have supplied uh, slides and also advice for me for this presentation. Mel and uh, Dan and, and Jay also have been uh, working on uh, 
these numbers that I showed. So I would like to thank you for the, your attention and entertain any questions if I know how to answer. Thank you. Can you turn this on, please? Check. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Zhao. I think that's uh, certainly a, a powerful amount of information. You know, it's, uh, I have selective hearing, so when I get done listening to your presentation, I, I understand that we're going to have um, perfect, flawless data. Our fees are going to continue to go down, and we're not going to have any evaluation errors. Is that correct? Not going to have any evaluation errors. <laughs> So I think it's, uh, it is pretty powerful and certainly all the information. So I certainly open the floor for any questions. I've got a couple questions I'd like to ask uh, Zhao as well, but certainly if uh, uh, the microphone there would be uh, open for any questions and I would certainly entertain to, uh, to bring them forward. Zhao, one, one of the comments that uh, you know, certainly opened your presentation with was the, uh, the two blocks of uh, you know, genomics, if you will, or you know, with uh, Eurogenomics and North America. Do you see more collaboration between those two and what would the impact be if they could be closer together and more impactful? Where do you see that going moving forward? Well, I, I haven't been uh, involved in the uh, uh, exchange of, uh, of genotype. This is mostly CDDR that uh, is running. Uh, I'm just back from uh, this uh, interval meeting in Germany. And uh, of course, I, uh, my, ba my background shows that I, I, I see that collaborating uh, and sharing information, you can still have a healthy competition. Uh, so these blocks, they still have competition internally, uh, but they just uh, chose to benefit from having a common uh, database. I see that as a uh, possibility. I really think that uh, this is this was a temporary uh, solution for uh, well a, a, an industry that was learning where we were going and uh, how things were were, were being organized. Uh, there is some reluctancy to uh, sometimes participate in the international uh, cooperation, but. Uh, um, I see more and more that uh, in one way or another, uh, people are talking about uh, this, uh, uh, well, facilitating exchanges. That is basically the, the, the idea now. Even if <clears throat> we are in diff two different blocks, you can see by the numbers I showed that we have a large number of the animals uh, from the Euro, uh, genomics yes. uh, database already in our database, Clearly. meaning that uh, exchanges have been happening even uh, though we're not partners. No, I certainly, it's, it's certainly a healthy relationship. There's no question. I appreciate those, those comments that I'm sure there's, uh, there's as, you, as you indicated, uh, change is inevitable and it's going to continue. And I think there's uh, certainly been so many strengths of, that have been developed through those changes. And as you, you know, walk through the changes that have occurred, even in the short period of time, you know, that you've been here, uh, even in uh, prior to you coming here, it's going to be inevitable that they will continue to evolve and, and move forward. And, and as you indicate, you know, we're doing it for, for, for the betterment of the dairy cow and, and the farm and being profitable. So I think it uh, certainly shows steps forward. And uh, certainly as visionaries here in this room, I think they certainly welcome to see where, where it's going to take us and certainly the genetic progress that it has brought uh, in the last number of years as well.
we're just a couple more registrations away from uh, being organized. So if uh, you guys could.